Hi, I am Dr. Luda Bajanova, Professor of Medicine from University of California, San Diego. Today, I will be discussing managing toxicity from checkpoint inhibitors. Here are my disclosures. Objectives for today is to look at usage of immunotherapy in the special populations, including HIV, hepatitis. We're also gonna cover specific management of adverse events and talk about outcomes um, if your patients have immune-related adverse events or not. Immune-related adverse events have unique characteristics. They are reversible if treated promptly. If left untreated, they will progress to a more severe state. And also, if treated early, you will see that duration and severity of immune-related adverse events will be lower. There is no rule um, any organ can be affected. On average, immune-related adverse event will start about six to 12 weeks after initiation of therapy. However, it could happen within days out of the first dose. And most importantly, it could happen even after you discontinue immunotherapy. The good news is that immune-related adverse events are generally not fatal. So if you look at a couple of large retrospective databases, you see that um, fatality rate, patient fatality rate of immune-related adverse events is about 0.6%. As you can also see on the right side of this slide that fatality depends on immune-related adverse event itself. As you can see here, my myocarditis has almost 50% fatality rate contrary to colitis or hypophysitis where a fatality rate in a single digits or low teens. Before starting immunotherapy, it is very important to try to understand what is the risk of your patient developing immunotoxicity. It is important to collect personal as well as family history of autoimmune diseases and also remember less commonly known autoimmune conditions such as psoriasis, diabetes, sarcoidosis. At this point, we do not have any blood-based biomarkers that are helpful for us to determine which of our patients will develop adverse events on immunotherapy. So what do we know about giving immunotherapy to patients with autoimmune disorders? Not much because patients with autoimmune disorders have been excluded from immunotherapy trials and all our available information comes mostly from retrospective case series, which is certainly uh, subject to a publication bias. Here, I summarized all the available retrospective data. As you can see here, the patient numbers are relatively small, ranging from eight to about 112 patients. Different types of autoimmune disorders were included. What we can learn from reviewing those retrospective data sets is that overall, the risk of exacerbation of autoimmune condition on immunotherapy ranges from about 24% to about 40%. Also, it is very important to notice that if your patient has pre-existing active symptoms, logically, you have a higher likelihood of developing immune-related adverse event on therapy. So what is the summary of managing your patient with autoimmune disorders and considering giving immunotherapy? So I would say I would definitely consider giving immunotherapy if autoimmune disease is controlled. It is also important to state that the type of autoimmune disease matter. I personally would avoid um, giving immunotherapy to your patients with myasthenia gravis, even if it's controlled, because if it's exacerbated, the case fatality rate is going to be high. Also, it is very important to pay attention to the degree of pre-existing end-organ damage. For example, if you're talking about the patient with scleroderma who already has severe pulmonary fibrosis and oxygen dependent, maybe it is not a good idea to give immunotherapy to that patient. Um, you can tell your patient that risk of exacerbation of autoimmune disorder is approximately 25 to 40%, and it will be higher if the disease is not controlled at the time of the immunotherapy start. The good news is also that majority of the exacerbations are easily controlled by immunosuppression. And also remember, um, as I pointed in the beginning of my talk, 
exacerbation can happen at any point after the studies start, including after you stop the immunotherapy. So let's talk about other populations, HIV, Hep B and C and organ transplant. In this population, we also have a fairly minimal systematic published data. We have um, a large, the largest data set is retrospective review of patients treated in 16 centers. And there were 42 patients who had HIV, Hep B, C um, and organ transplant. So out of five patients with solid organ transplant, four of them had renal transplant, one liver transplant. Patient with liver transplant um, had graft rejection and died after a single dose. There was 14 patients with Hep C and 12 patients with Hep B. None of them had loss of viral control or had autoimmune hepatitis. There was also a phase one trial recently reported um, for patients receiving PDL1 therapy post hematopoietic stem cell transplant for hematologic malignancies. And upon induction with um, PD1 or PDL1 therapy, they have seen severe GVHD and some were GVHD were fatal. So I would be very careful using immunotherapy in a patient post stem cell transplant. HIV is a very special uh, population that I want to concentrate a little bit more on. Um, we initially had concerns on using immunotherapy in patients uh, with HIV because they already have abnormalities in the immune system. And we always had question if we are giving immunotherapy to those patients, if they have a baseline perturbation in the immune system, will immunotherapy even going to work? Also, um, there was a case of TB reactivation after immunotherapy that gave everybody pause to consider immunotherapy for our HIV patients. So the data that we have for that population also consists in very, from very small retrospective data sets. As you can see, it's single digit patients. But it is important to know and reassuring to know that in all of those patients who were treated in those retrospective analysis showed that HIV load remained suppressed and CD4 count was stable. And we actually saw some responses in those patients. Then we have a prospective phase one trial on HIV patients, which included patients who were eligible for PD-1 therapy based on a different hematological malignancies, patients with lung cancer, um, lymphoma, um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and melanoma were included in that study. One of the inclusion criteria is that HIV had to be controlled. Uh, CD4 count um, defined, uh, controlled HIV was defined as a CD4 count as more than 100. If it's less than uh, 200, then uh, CD4 um, to CD8 ratio has to be more than four. Patients needed to be on effective antiretroviral ther therapy for at least a month before enrolling in the clinical trial. Clinical trial enrolled patients in three cohorts based on their CD4 uh, positive T cells level. They were giving standard dose of pembrolizumab and they enrolled 40 patients. So what that prospective clinical trial taught us is that pembrolizumab works in our HIV patients, and it has similar adverse event profiles as in non-HIV patients. We've seen some responses, and there were no significant changes in CD4 count and HIV viral load. However, there was a single case that um, needs to be highlighted. In that phase one clinical trial, um, they saw one death, and that was a patient with Kaposi and prior history of Kaposi associated inflammatory cytokine syndrome. And he developed marked Kaposi viremia and inflammatory syndromes and died. The autopsy was performed and showed diffuse um, KHSV associated polycomal B cell lymphoproliferation in major organs, and that was the cause of death. So they attributed the death um, related to multicentric Castleman's disease. So therefore, when you are considering immunotherapy in your HIV patient, make sure you ask the question if your patient had multicentric Castleman's and recommendations is to exclude the patients from PD-1 therapy if they have a multicentric Castleman's disease within the last five years.
if you have a patient who does not have a diagnosis of uh, multicentric Castleman's, but have symptoms which could be suggestive for Castleman's, recommendation is to get KHSV viral load, get the CT scan and biopsy all the enlarged or accessible enlarged lymph nodes to rule out um, pre-existing Castleman's. If you happen to develop Kaposi sarcoma induced multicentric Castleman disease on immunotherapy, the management is slightly different. Usually you would consider steroids, but in this situation, rituximab is something that is being recommended. So how do you manage and monitor patients with immune related? There are several useful references um, that you can find helpful um, in um, managing immune-related adverse events. And those are guidelines from NCCN, uh, CITSI, ASCO, and ESMO. NCCN guidelines actually have a very useful questionnaire that you can give to your patients before each immunotherapy administration. And it also has a wallet card that your patient can carry. Um, it is not a secret that sometimes when your patients comes to the emergency room, some of the emergency room physicians might not be aware of immune-related adverse events. So it's very important to educate your patient that when they show up in the urgent care or emergency room that they need to notify their treating physician that they are on immunotherapy because several side effects of immunotherapy can be difficult to diagnose unless you suspect it. So what also important information in NCCN guidelines that I find useful. So NCCN guidelines has a table which goes through the monitoring of um, toxicities. Um, how often do you check the blood test? How often do you recommend to do the physical exam? They also have recommendations on steroid refractory immune related adverse events. Basically, if you give your patients steroids and they fail to respond, when is the time to step up your um, immunosuppressants? And also very important, and I don't have time to go through that in my talk, um, each specific adverse event in NCCN guidelines have recommendations on the challenge. So how do you manage immune-related adverse events? Um, it is managed by grading. So if you have a grade one immune-related um, adverse event, um, you use supportive treatments such as antidiarrheal medication, skin creams, hydration, electrolytes, it is very important that you increase the monitoring of the uh, patient. I would recommend having your nurse reaching out to the patients maybe once or twice a week to make sure that they're still having a grade one adverse event. And also because many of our adverse events um, can manifest as a signs of infection, you make sure that you exclude the C. diff colitis or you exclude the pneumonia um, in your patient with diarrhea or shortness of breath. Also, it is very important to educate your patient when to call you back and when to report worsening of immune-related adverse events. Grade two immune-related adverse events, you basically do the same thing as you did in grade one, but you also have to hold the drug. And you have to hold the drug until your symptoms resolve to grade one. Also, it is very important as you're holding the drug, if your patient is not improving in a week, you have to start them on corticosteroids. And you can start with a 0.5 mix per kick per day or one mix per kick today. And then if the symptoms have resolved, you could consider rechallenging your patient. Um, grade three adverse event, you do pretty much the same thing um, as grade one and two. You hold immunotherapy, you start the steroids, but then you also have to consider additional immunosuppression the timeline for that is actually much shorter. So if in two days, if you have a grade three immune related adverse event and your patient is not improving in two days, please consider stepping up the immunosuppressive regime. You can use infliximab or you can use mycophenolate. Um, same here, you wait until symptoms resolve to grade one and then you slowly taper over three to six weeks. Um, make sure you watch for the rebound of the symptoms because your patient's immune-related adverse event can recur, recur as you're tapering down the steroids. Very important thing, do not forget about PCT prophylaxis, prophylaxis if your patient requires a prolonged taper. Um, NCCN guidelines currently recommending Bactrim if you are on 20 milligrams for at least four weeks, which pretty much all of your patients with immune-related adverse events will do that. 
The challenge for grade three address events is controversial, needs to be decided on an individual basis. And I would recommend you to go into NCCN guidelines and look at each specific address event and decide if the challenge is appropriate. Also important to stress that there is no dose reductions for immunotherapies. Um, contrary to what we do for chemotherapy and target therapy where we dose reduce for toxicities, with immunotherapy is all or none approach. You stay on the same dose when you're ready to restart your immunotherapy, you keep the same dose, you do not dose reduce. Grade four adverse events, you basically do same thing as in grade three, but um, I would not recommend rechallenge, and I would recommend permanently discontinue immunotherapy in that patient. So what if you had a patient who had an immune-related adverse event and you successfully managed it and it's now grade one and you are now considering the challenge? What data do we have? Here we have what's called um, a rule of halves. So this is based on a retrospective review of a single institution of about 482 patients receiving immunotherapy. And those patients, 38 of them developed immune-related adverse event and after the immune-related adverse event, the physician felt comfortable rechallenging. What they saw that half of the patients had immune-related adverse event recur, and half of the recurrences were the same immune-related adverse event, and half of the recurrences were a different immune-related adverse event. So therefore, the name rule of halves. Why am I explaining that? Um, I think it is very important to remember that if, you, if your patient had colitis and you managed the immune-related adverse event and now you are rechallenged them, it is important to keep your mind open and not just ask for the symptoms of the colitis because your patient can have pneumonitis, they can have hypo hypophysitis. Also, it was useful in that paper to see that there are two factors that were felt to be associated with recurrence of immune-related adverse event. Number one is if your immune-related adverse event required hospitalization, it's more likely to recur. And early immune-related adverse events, which started within three months of initiation of immunotherapy, also have more likelihood of recurrence. We also know that patients who develop immune-related adverse events actually have better outcomes, so which is reassuring. And that's, I think, one of the reasons we are considering the challenge. We have several retrospective analyses that I mentioned here in non-small cell lung cancer, as well as in melanoma, which confirms that immune-related adverse event on immunotherapy projects better outcomes. We also know that giving our patients um, steroids uh, when you manage immune-related adverse events does not affect outcomes. This is slightly different than giving steroids for unrelated to immunotherapy issues, but do not hesitate to treat your patients with steroids if you are treating immune-related adverse events. A couple of key toxicity points. So colitis, um, if your patient develop bowel perforations, do not forget to stop infliximab and you manage that surgically. In the autoimmune hepatitis, do not use infliximab because it has potential for hepatic toxicity. And if you need to step up immunosuppressive regime, use mycophenolate. If your patient has an asymptomatic elevation of amylase and lipase, it is very important to ask the patient about uh, pancreatitis symptoms, but if they don't have any, it is okay to continue despite elevations. And another kind of a tip um, on managing, if you think about pneumonitis, think about myocarditis. Do not forget to check troponins on your patients because those two commonly come hand in hand and symptoms would be similar, um, which is usually shortness of breath. So a couple of other things on endocrinopathy, hypothyroidism is managed with hormone replacement therapy. Um, we have seen adrenal insufficiency, which is treated with hydrocortisone. There are very rare combinatorial toxicities where your patients can develop both adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism. And in that situation, just remember that you need to start them with steroids and do not give thyroxine first because that will uh, precipitate adrenal crisis. So key take home points um, in immunotherapy, uh, we have to be aware of immunotherapy toxicities because they can be life-threatening if not managed properly. 
Um, you can administer immunotherapy to your patients with autoimmune conditions, but you have to be vigilant um, about immune-related adverse events. And you can quote the patient, the risk of exacerbation of autoimmunity is about 25 to 40%. Um, immunotherapy can be given to patients with HIV and chronic hepatitis. Just be aware of potential exacerbation of multicentric cathode ones, which could be fatal to your patient. It is fine to give steroids um, to control immune-related adverse events, and this, as this is not detrimental to your patient's outcome. Um, patients who had immune-related adverse events generally have better outcomes. It is very important to be proactive in anticipation of immune-related adverse events, and you need to educate your patient, your nurses, your primary care physicians, and your emergency room physicians. And then there are plenty of resources, which I cannot include in a 20 minutes talk, but I absolutely love NCCN guidelines um, because it has a very detailed information on managing and rechallenging for each specific adverse event.